Joan Agajanian Quinn is the former West Coast editor of Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine and society editor of the Herald Examiner. Her cover stories are seen in Venice and Detour magazines, and she is a contributing editor to Angelus Magazine. For the next half hour, Joan will bring you inside news and views on society, art, film, and the exhilarating worlds of these multifaceted people. Here is Joan Quinn. Welcome to Etc. Our guests are Ursula Hermosinski from Christie's and actress Paula Prentice. Paula has been in the business for years. To mention some of her credits will do her dishonor, but I'm going to take a little swing at it and give a smattering of uh, what she's been in. She had a television series called He and She, TV movie, Having Babies, Top of the Hill. In film, she was in Where the Boys Are, Catch-22, and that famous role in The Stepford Wives. And in the theater, The Norman Conquest on Broadway, and As You Like It, with New, the New York Shakespeare Festival. But recently, Paula starred in A.R. Gurney's two-person play, Love Letters, at the Pasadena Playhouse and at the Cannon Theater in Beverly Hills, with her husband, actor Dick Benjamin. How was it working with Dick, Paula? Ah, oh, <laughs> divine. And it looked like it was divine on stage. It was a wonderful experience, not only because we hadn't worked together for such a long time, but because it clarifies a marriage. <laughs> In many ways, we had been married for 30 years, and the length of time that we had spent together almost matched those years spent together by the couple in the play, which was 50 years. Our time spent together was 30 years, so we took it by the horns and ran with it. I wondered if you found any similarities in the play and in your real life. Yes, I think the fact that we have known each other for such a long time does enable us to enjoy it all that much more. What about Gurney's writing? Did, uh, d does that kind of follow the same kind of Beverly Hills lifestyle? Well, I grew up in Texas and Dick grew up in New York, but children are children and his writing is so superb that you take the words in your mouth and just let them rest there and the play carries you. You don't have to act. Oh, I disagree. I, uh, maybe I, I disagree because I've seen it a couple of times and it seemed so real. The, y you came across so honest in, in your role and you would look at the audience and you'd smile or you'd give a little nudge to Dick and I was wondering about the, the director. He was excellent. I had two directors. We had a director in Pasadena and then the director here who has been working with these people at the Canon for about a year. Is it the same director with, with each two people? Yes, it is. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It's the same director, yeah. It's interesting what he got out of you or what you gave then and what I've seen other people. He uh, gave some wonderful beats. Those are the moments that let you live and breathe in between the lines and he gave some wonderful beats to us. I think you were, seemed very uh, relaxed because I noticed partway through the play your shoes had been kicked off. <laughs> <laughs> I figured she wouldn't wear high heels then. Uh-uh. <laughs> and Dick was kind of like, just, just like the wonderful husband, not your husband though actually in the play, but a relationship that did go on for, as yes. you say, ever, through all kinds of uh, Yes. I think underneath the relationship between the two of them is sex. And if you carry that all the way through the play, you do the play justice. What about working together again? There are, so, there are not very many famous actor-actress combos um, anymore. Do you think that you'll go back and you and Dick will start doing projects together like I this? I hope so. I hope if we do this again we'll get to play for about a week because uh, the play is different each night and I think it grows with the doing of it. It's interesting, you couldn't do this play for more than a week I don't think because of the nature of the reading. Really? Then you could pick it up again in a couple of weeks. Well, it's consuming? It's what it is and you know how things have their own nature and their own kind of life. It's, it's a particular form of life, and the life will quiver there and hover there for, I would imagine, about a week. And then you'd have to take a rest from it, oh. because it's a reading, yes, uh-huh. Um, but it certainly 
enlarged our vision of working together again. It was so wonderful and I don't know, I think sometimes if you're an actor and an actress and have a marriage, it, it heightens the marriage in many ways, a spiritual way almost, even though it's about sex. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you meet Dick? We met at Northwestern University. I was very cold because I had come from Texas and I didn't know about silk underwear. I hadn't started skiing yet, so I put on all of the clothes that I brought with me from Texas and he was attracted to this heap. Oh, he was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, w were you in acting school together? Yes, we were. He was um, a director and I didn't know anything about acting, but he put me in um, a Scott Fitzgerald play. I played Zelda. Oh, perfect. <laughs> and we had long rehearsals and all the rest of the cast was sent home and before we knew it, we had fallen in love. And you, did you get married right in school? No, we got married when MGM said they wouldn't send us to England together unless we were married, when I was going on tour. So you had already moved to Los yes, Angeles? Yes, we had. We had both moved there, yeah. So that's why you got married? Yes, to we go did. On it was tour? A, a free trip. <laughs> and you've been like that ever since? Yes, uh-huh. Yes, we have. <laughs> I uh, have a clip of one of your movies, Parallax View. We didn't uh, mention it earlier, but give us a little... Uh, history or a little beginning of what we're going to be seeing on the screen? Um, Warren Beatty plays uh, an unconventional reporter. I am a newscaster and uh, there was an assassination of um, a person like Robert Kennedy and uh, supposedly the Warren Commission or something like the Warren Commission decided that it was a waiter who had run away from the scene who had died. Mm -hmm. But in reality, three years later, people began to die. And so what I'm doing when I come to Warren, who was my lover before, I'm saying, I need you, there's something going on and I don't know what it is. He thinks that I'm my, my same old self-destructive self. So he doesn't really believe me and he doesn't want to get involved in this kind of thing. So let's watch. Parallax view. Why are you here this time? I huh? told you. Somebody's what? trying to kill me. Oh, Jesus. Somehow I don't think I should be looking at this. Just look. What? Oh, come on. I looked at this film. I was blue in the face three years ago. Since the assassination, six of these people have died in some kind of an accident. Four. Look, nobody's trying to kill you, huh? These people were killed. And whoever killed them is going to try to kill me. Austin Tucker thinks so, too. Austin thinks that maybe we all saw something up there. Yeah, well, we did see something up there, didn't we? No, I mean something else. Well, what do you mean by something else? Does he ever indicate what he means by that? Has he ever indicated to you that he saw anything other than what was in the commission report? No. Nothing? No. Did you see anything up there? No. Well, neither did I. And believe me, I looked. We all looked. You mean if you didn't see it, it's not there. Well, I didn't say that. It's just that I know all about these accidents. Ralph Scaletta was a known lush. He hit a piling in the George Washington Bridge. He killed three other people with him. Joy Holder died of anaphylactic shock when the doctor gave her the wrong antibiotic. Herbert Moon burned himself up in bed smoking, which his girlfriend always told him he was going to do, and Harry Lutz had a heart attack. Harry Lutz was 40 years old. It's too young to have a heart attack. Oh, it's not. He was thin. He was in a terrific condition. shit. He condition. found out his wife was banging her psychiatrist, and on the same day, a bulldozer accidentally knocked over half his house. Come on, he was lucky to last that long. That's future shock, Lee. You mean you no longer believe that there was another assassin involved in shooting Carol? That's right. But it was an explanation. People were crazy for any kind of explanation then. Every time you turned around, some nut was knocking off one of the best men in the country. Okay. Okay. But there's six out of 18 dead. Four. That was the last time you looked. Since then, Norman Lomax has died. And now Arthur Bridges. What are you talking about? A fishing accident. Where the hell is Salmon Tail? 
Sam and Tail is where Austin Tucker is now. I tried to reach him. Well, why don't you call him? Sam and Tail looks like a small town. Take me. Take me there. Yeah. We could we could catch a plane and we could be there this evening. Mm -hmm. Not really. Please. Just call him up. It's a fishing accident. You want to hear about my day? I got some real problems. <laughs> you what? son of a bitch! <laughs> you don't care! Hey, don't do this. Hey. Lee. Paula, that was so intense. How did you draw those emotions? <laughs> Let's get a little comedy up there. That's all I can say after seeing something like that. I mean, it's all right. It's all right, but I like comedy. But look at the difference from a person who likes comedy to something so intense. How did you get yourself uh, uh, well, worked into that? I did that? the best I could at that time. I, I've learned more about acting because I'm older, and acting is a wonderful art in that life gives it to you rather than practice. It's a very interesting art. But Warren and I worked on that scene. He's a terrific person to work with because he wants to do it over and over until it's it's correct. So so did you have to cry each time? How do you get You're those supposed tears? To. Well, there are many ways to do it. Some are some are good and some aren't good. I think uh, as I've grown as a person, it doesn't matter if the tears come or not. That's not what it's about. It's about the scene. You know what I'm saying? Oh, oh yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. You know, the other thing, if people think of you as a comedy and this is very dramatic. Do people come up to you and still talk about the character you played in The Stepford Wives? Everybody likes that, yes. She was funny. <laughs> she, she, she was very intense, too. She was kind of scary, but funny. <laughs> You that? Because I think the first, one of the first times I ever saw you, that's like the first thing that click, you know, clicks into your mind. We're all Stepford <laughs> Wives. <laughs> How did she do it? How did you play that? Because it was a, a long time filming it, wasn't it? It was a pretty long time, and I had just had my son. He was three months old, and it was wrenching for me to go to work and leave this little tiny baby. He's now 17 and much taller than I am, so that was just like yesterday. But to go and do this, I, I said, this is good. Mom will get out of the house and, and stuff like that. Uh, when I stab my friend, or she stabs me, it's, <laughs> they put a board here over underneath my apron and she stabbed in the board, so I didn't feel anything. I continued to be the robot that I was. That's why. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Well, all this time has gone by and you have two children. Yes. And they're both working towards show business, Yes, it I seems. think they are, yes, which I, I love. I love people in the theater, I love people in the dance world, I love people in television. I, I think they're wonderful people, so I'm, I'm happy that my children want to do this. I think they're also very bright, so if they want to make money, maybe they'll figure out some way to do this and make money. Are you a typical stage mother? Yes, I'm just like <laughs> Ethel Merman in Baby June. I'm, I'm at the back saying, smile, Baby June. Yes, I am. Smile Prentice. Yes, yes, I'm always saying smile to my child. She, mother, my, you're so uncool. Leave me alone. But she's performed in the Beverly Hills school system, yes. and I think uh, uh, being a part of it the way you have been, it, you've been a good mother. Thank you've been you. there at the school, yes. doing your library duty. Yes, that's right. Thank you so much. <laughs> I want them each to have something that they enjoy doing so they have a very strong identity. And we're going to be looking for them. Thank because you. Because we know that they're, they're going to have uh, that Benjamin household on end. I don't know how the four of you are making... A lot of laughs. Is that, is that yeah, how it gets laughs, going? Especially with Dick in the house, yeah. I think one thing you said before they, before you go to bed at night, if something's <laughs> happened, what do you make Dick take over? Oh, please, I'm too serious. <laughs> and he? he's so funny. He just lightens the whole thing, so you never go to sleep at night feeling depressed. Well, we're going to leave you right now. We're going to take a break, and we're going to come back with a, an auctioneer from Christie's. If you'll wait and sit yes. with Ursula, we'll see what she has to I tell sure us. I sure will. Thank you, Joan. Thank Enjoy you. It. We'll be right back.
We're back with Paula Prentice and Ursula Hermosinski. Ursula's career in the arts has brought her to Los Angeles. She works at Christie's Auction House, where she is an auctioneer. How did this all start, Ursula? Well, Joan, it started at a very, very young age, I have to say. I was the type of kid that was rummaging through Grandma's closet, <laughs> looking at her vintage clothing, only it wasn't vintage to her then, um, through my mother's jewelry box. I loved, loved things. And your schooling, you, if you're fortunate enough to be able to study the things you enjoy, I studied art history, and the most fortunate or advantageous uh, part to my education was being accepted to Christie's Fine Arts program. Christie's has a year-long program in London for people who are just interested in, in the fine and decorative arts. And that was really my introduction to both Christie's and the huge scope of things that people collect. What time in your life did that uh, happen? going to London after college during college immediately after college I was very lucky that I packed up my bags and went straight over there for the year what did you you studied art history in college and then you went right to, to London that's right and that's right. after you finished that program where did you go well directly from that program another lucky break was an introduction into the museum world I had a studentship at the Peggy Guggenheim collection <gasps> in Venice oh how wonderful and how long were you there and incredible well it started out as a two-month position and I stayed there about six months more and more oh. projects kept coming up and even as the museum was closed I helped the director there um, just put the collection to bed so to speak for the winter we have an artist who lives in Los Angeles, Claire Falkenstein, mm -hmm. who made the gates to mm -hmm. that, um, the iron gates. Yeah, the, the very famous iron gates. Very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And when um, I was there not long ago, I noticed a lot of students, or were they, are they interns? Do they have people working there all the time? Yeah, all the time. As with most museums, they, the Guggenheim collection relies very heavily on its volunteers. And the students come in during the summer mostly, and they guard the collection, answer people's questions, um, and also assist the director in any number of administrative duties. It's a wonderful, wonderful time. Did you learn to speak Italian while you were there? See, <laughs> the important thing. Do you understand that? I wish I understood Italian since I am Italian, but I don't. <laughs> no, I, I can make my way around. When was your first time on the podium as an auctioneer? And how did you get to be an auctioneer? It's one thing working at Christie's and having your art background and knowing about museums and collections, but how do you get up at a podium? and? Another one of those things, I had always wanted to be an auctioneer. The minute I was in London <laughs> at Christie's and saw Joe Floyd, very, very famous international auctioneer, uh, saw him do his thing, so to speak. I was mesmerized. And I love, love, love the auction process. I was so fascinated by how things moved with the, the fall of the gavel. So I just said to myself right then and there, I'm going to go to New York and I'm going to work for Christie's and I'm going to be the youngest female auctioneer. Do they train you to be an auctioneer or do you go to auctioneer school? Well, that's hard to answer. With all my great ambition and desire, Christie's didn't hire me right away. <laughs> they didn't want me and all my enthusiasm for a while. So I went back to the Midwest and I took a job at Milwaukee Auction Galleries. Oh, very and clever. And I started there. <laughs> and I would do things like catalog uh, a sale and then the owner of the auction galleries, a very, very lovely woman, saw that I had this background at Christie's and it looked great and assumed that I should go up in the podium. And I did and it was the most wonderful way to break the turf. That was your first time? What was your first time on the podium? My first time at the podium was at an on-the-premises sale where we were sitting in a great living room of a beautiful house on Lake oh. Michigan selling the contents of the living room and I sh shared the auctioneering duties with one of the local weathermen and they just put me up right in the middle. I'd never done it before. And the next thing you know, I just looked at this crowd of faces and I was horrible. I was absolutely horrible. I think I was going backwards in the in increments, but they kept me on for about 10 more y lots, yanked me off. But the owner of the gallery said, you know, kid, you've got a good voice. So she just let me go on from there. Were you afraid? 
Oh, terrified. I still am today. <laughs> That's I wonder, still do you still get stage fright when you get up there? Absolutely, absolutely. Did you take voice training? No, I didn't. Because you do have a wonderful yes. voice for that. Wonderful. Or I, a voice for anything, but I think... Uh, Thank you. But no, it's just practice. It's just practice, and you do it, and you have to feel comfortable with it, and you have to... Um, really concentrate on numbers. Yeah, oh, that's, that's what the main thing is. Mm -hmm. I know you, you, you're afraid, but I think the audience is afraid too. That's right. Auctioneer, How, auctioning is a very intimidating process to some. What do you mean? Because they'll bid for something and, and wish that they hadn't? Or they're why? afraid scratch to move, aren't they? Yeah. They're afraid. When she says, scratch your nose, I think uh -huh. the audience, the first time audience, is always afraid to move. But, right. but if you're a good auctioneer, you know that she's scratching her nose, don't That's you? That's right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's right. I would make it very clear to you. I would say, the lady in the blue blazer, it's your bid. Or, madam, is it your bid at 350? Making eye contact. So mm -hmm. no one's going to buy a Van Gogh mm -hmm. with the scratch of a nose. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. also, mm -hmm. a scratch of a nose or a lift of a pencil has been established with you before. Mm -hmm. Is that true? That's right. That's right. I mean, we see that in the movies, but is it really true? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, the old school, the London auctions, before we had such things as paddles. Now you bid with auction paddles and you're a number. Um, <laughs> but in the old days, the, the sale room, the auction world was a very small, intimate circle of people, the dealers, the private collectors. And the auctioneer knew all these people. He was friendly with these people. So Mr. A would have his little sign, Mr. B would have his little sign. Because A and B, of course, were, were rivals. But they didn't want each other to know what they were doing? That's so it right. wasn't a sign that everyone would know? That's right. it, was it was just a specialized sign that only the auctioneer knew. That's correct. So you knew how far to go, or they know how far to go. That's it's right. It's like being a conductor in a way, isn't it, of an orchestra? Well, she's yeah. on top of everything up yeah. there. I mean, she makes the tenor of the room. You make right. things... I, I've never seen you in action, but I know what happens at an auction house. I think our viewers, um, a, a lot of people watching, are afraid to go to auctions. Mm -hmm. I think they're interested in it, but they're afraid to go just for the things that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. And um, how can we get people to go either for fun or to buy or just to be educated? Because if you're talking about furniture, you can go sit in one auction after another and learn so much just That's from right. the auctioneer. That's right. That's an excellent point. The auction rooms, the sales rooms, as we call them, are, are great educational grounds. You can go during an exhibition, you can lift up a piece of furniture, you can touch it, you can open the drawers, you can take the drawer out, you can call one of our specialists over and say, I don't understand, what does George III style mean? And we're happy to go through that with you. We'll teach you about these things, as opposed to, to a museum where, you know, look, don't touch, um, some of the very intimidating antique stores. But it's really, it, it's a workable thing. It's, it's a very, you participate in the um, exhibition. We also publish catalogs that are I was going to ask you, you talked about uh, working on the catalogs, or cataloging a, sh a show, mm -hmm. you said, when you talked about being in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And can you show us? Uh, That's right. For example, for who, a furniture who, How sale. do you catalog a show? What does uh, that mean? The property will come into New York about three months prior to any given sale. The experts and the specialists in charge then go through the property, they do their research, and they illustrate the property for the catalog, and they write, um, they tell you what it is, um, if there's any history on the piece, they tend to include that, and then they'll tell you, most importantly, what they think it'll fetch at auction. And based on this catalog, if you follow the catalogs, then you'll have an indication of the things you're interested, what they should sell for. Have you ever no. been to an auction? No, I haven't. No, have I you think ever the thought only of going? auction I've been to is for pigs or cows or something like that in it, Texas. I imagine it works the same uh -huh, way. That's uh -huh. right. <laughs> More or less. Uh -huh. More or less. <laughs> what are the trends in buying and selling right now? I know you, uh, you held up a, a furniture a furniture catalog. Well, we're doing everything. The wonderful thing about Christie's is that it has such a huge, huge scope. This is a painting that we estimate will make between eight and ten million dollars. It's by Leger. It's called Le Petit Déjeuner and it's part of the Tremaine collection which we will be selling. So we go from very, very important pictures painted in 1921 to one of our more recent endeavors. For the first time ever, Christie's will be selling cells 
do you got it? Cells. Celluloids. Celluloids. Celluloids from The Simpsons. And this is original artwork <laughs> made <laughs> specifically for the cover of our catalog. And we'll be selling these. And, and it's a break from tradition, yes. isn't it? Cells or celluloids became famous with the old Disney. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. What, stockpile or whatever they had around mm -hmm. the studio. But nobody paid much attention to that. Now there's a swatch catalog, That's swatch right. watch catalog, and watches and clocks, and there's always been art. You have and something got, else that's very... We've got some wine. We'll wine. sell wine by auction. We're, we're very well known for our wine sales, which we hold twice a year here in Los Angeles, as well as in Chicago. And we are breaking ground in North America with our vintage motor car sales. We'll be up in Pebble Beach. Oh, yes, I saw that. Yeah, for that sale there, too. Well, maybe I've seen that. Maybe you've seen one yeah. of them. How do the California buyers compare with the New York buyers? Because you were working in New York, and now you're in Los Angeles. Just as ruthless in, Are their, they? in, their, in their collecting, um, just as exquisite in their taste, and very, very educated. The, the ones who call us, who use the resource of the regional office, call us, we answer their questions, we get the answer for them, and they've, they've secured some incredible, incredible pictures. Tell us uh, about bidding kind of demystify that again for us. There are different ways of bidding, different processes. That's right. You don't need to be in New York or London to participate in our sales. You can bid by telephone. You can fax your bids into our customer service uh, representatives. The auctioneer will execute your bids. A member of the department will execute your bids. We are here in all our regional offices to help you buy or sell your property. One thing that Paula was talking about earlier when she said, are people afraid to go to auctions? What if somebody buys something? And I know this is probably putting you on the spot, mm -hmm. but you buy something and you, you look at it and you go, oh, I just got caught up in the, the furor of what was going on. I don't want that. I mean, if you buy something from a store, you have the opportunity of maybe exchanging it or doing something. And I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think a lot of people think about that. That's mm -hmm. right. Well, in our conditions of sales, it states that the sale transaction is made at the fall of the hammer. <laughs> However, <laughs> in, my, in my auctioneering, I will make a little announcement to the people before. If you think you've made a mistake, please tell me right away. Don't be shy. I'm not. Stand up. Tell me right away, and we'll see what we can do. You mean as the hammer falls? Yeah. You, you, as the hammer falls then? towards the end of the sale, while the sale's in still oh, in process, I, I and my, my colleagues who actually do the sales are very, well, I won't say very flexible, but right at that immediate moment, we can help you. We, can, we want you to be happy with your purchases. Are there a lot of women auctioneers, Sotheby's, Butterfields, um, no. 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 Ah, no. <laughs> well, we're lucky to have you. Thank you. We're really happy that you came over and told us a little bit about auction earring or mm -hmm. uh, That's right. playing with your hammer. Or <laughs> Paula, what do you love about LA? 